Good morning, everybody. My name is Abha Mariada Banerjee, and I'm a business lawyer turned social design and people building entrepreneur, also India's first internationally acclaimed woman motivational speaker, working on SDGs 4 and 5 with special focus on non-media education through entertainment. It's something different that I'm trying to do. I would be chairing this session on impact of investing in the ESG, that is the environment, sustainability, and governance sector. And we have some very interesting guests today with us, not to forget the impact of COVID that has had, it has had on the investment climate. Are we better off? Are we worse? Have new doors open or have we now to get into the troubleshooting mode? The sustainable development goals set by the United Nations General Assembly act as our guiding beacon. Investors are now looking to fulfill these goals, solving problems while facing human issues in every place in this globalized and hyper-connected world. And we have some very interesting people sitting and going to be talking about it today. Needless to say that it is now impossible to ignore or overlook these three areas, even if your business is not directly addressing them. We cannot ignore to include them in our business plans to raise finances for any business whatsoever. Many countries across the world have ambitious targets to address all these issues. Most, however, are still in the initiation stages with very nascent, no proven models. And that's an investor problem now. Environment, sustainability, and governance have long been the responsibility of the government mechanisms and did not pique the interests of investors in any and or private groups. But the rise of social entrepreneurship impact investment in areas that had long-term consequences on human existence, improving the quality of life, bettering people's way of living, has now taken on in a very big way. And especially the investors are looking at it because they are trying to profit from this kind of new opening that have come to them. Such investments may be thought of as supplement to government uh, and philanthropy in dealing with humanity's challenges, but investors, entrepreneurs, corporates are thinking of them as investments that chase the double bottom line. That is, they seek both profit and they seek the long-term impact. Investors and private people are now doing what the government should have been doing in every country. How to finance development is one of the most pressing questions in the reflections of sustainable development goals for the post-2015 development agenda, and now we're in 2020. According to the economists and policymakers, private sector investment is the key to sustainable growth, and there is a huge potential for private investment to become a significant part of sustainable development goals in India. Especially the government, if you see the government is now looking at ways to bring in investment, not just as FDI, but even from private investors within the country. With a, with a varied as well as this open landscape in the areas of ESG, ideas driven by technology, science, social design, skill, everything has become a possibility of a sustainable business. Funding businesses that have not yet found their footing or proven themselves as profit, their profitability quotient has been the learning curve for most entrepreneurs and also the investors. In the world economic situations and prospects, that is WP, WESP's 2019 mid-year update, it was reported that India's economy is projected to grow at 7.1% for the fiscal year 2020. COVID has turned it upside down. And we were supposed to piggyback on the strong domestic consumption and the FDIs and the investment, etc. COVID having altered the landscape completely with new problems to be addressed within the ESG gamut of activity, environment and sustainability, governance, all of it has actually changed and we are now still wondering what to do. Has the pandemic opened more doors for creating solutions or has it created ambiguity that will slow down the solution? Or are we now in the best time when impact investing, investing, social change and design become the flesh normal that can tackle even pandemic-like situations? Now, this is an important part for the investors who are on the panel today with a need for leap of faith. The investor community can best answer how they are coping with these issues and their views on what should be focused on. Most investors will be ruminating their investment plans for 2020. Everything has gone haywire. The rapid pace of growth in this field, that is environment, sustainability, governance, and impact investing, social growth, all of this is going to bring about something that is called capitalism 2.0, that is a more human and conscientious global impact economy. Our first panelist, I'm going to introduce to you Dr. Parag Agarwal, who is uh, uh, running a social enterprise called Janajal.com. 
and working in the safe water uh, sector where he's trying to get safe water available to people at a very, very affordable price. And he wants to speak about the enhanced role of safe water, safer safe water in the post COVID era. Parag, up to you. Thank you, Abba. Um, uh, uh, you know, I speak here today as uh, alongside all my illustrious panelists as an implementer and not really the investor, but the investee and the implementer on ground for corporates uh, and to help corporates and to drive sustainability across uh, environment, uh, planet, people uh, through a purpose which is so compelling that it has plagued the world and more so coming closer plagued India for decades now. Uh, I speak on ESG and I'd like to say that, you know, I think there will be personally, this is my, my opinion, that there will be only two types of uh, spending that will really now uh, galvanize this entire mission of social causes. One will be through the, that, the one that investors basically implement through their respective investments and investees and corporates, and the other will be sovereign spending. I see CSR being a heavily diluted form of uh, source of spending, source of capital that will actually go out and influence any kind of social activity. And going forward, it's going to be very, uh, it's, it's almost going to evolve very rapidly that every board will have a, a new position called the conscience keeper, uh, a director of conscience at every, on every board, because I think everybody has understood what the planet can do if it is not, if she's not taken care of. Everybody can understand and now has experienced the impact of being hit uh, and, and, you know, the, the entire apple cart being toppled by the planet and, its, uh, you know, its, its descent, its show of descent. So, you know, I mean, uh, I can speak much longer. I understand I have just a two minute uh, opening submission, but I just want to bring in the focus away from CSR and towards ESG and towards uh, responsible uh, conduct by every corporate going forward. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for us for those uh, two minutes of your uh, work and introduction. Let me bring on board Praveen. Uh, Praveen is the founder. Praveen Khatao is the founder and CEO of uh, Londinium Asset Management Limited. And he's an alumni of the Wharton School, uh, University of Pennsylvania, and also from the UCLA. Uh, Praveen, at the moment, is the non-executive director of 2i Capital, an India-focused private equity firm, and trans warrantly finance an investment bank based in Mumbai. Uh, Praveen, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we approach uh, this space with an investor's hands on. So when people look at invest sustainable investing, what does that mean? Uh, they see positive returns and long-term impact on society, environment, and the performance of businesses. Uh, in, many, in, in many ways, that's translated to mean you take a hit to your performance because you're doing something good for the environment, for society. We don't believe that needs to be the case. We believe that you can find extremely good investments which have a very high ESG content. And I think that as we were, as the world comes out of the whole COVID situation, that's going to become much more important. Uh, another classic comment is, um, you know, uh, investments are more profitable if you look at them through a va economic value added lens. A classic example of this would be um, if you look at how, say, you have cold fire energy, uh, well, you just look at the cost of producing energy, but you ignore the the terrible impact of the environment that, that, that coal, coal causes. Again, we think that these sort of uh, business models will be assessed, reassessed as we, as we, as we move forward. Um, another key criteria here is, you know, when people say you want to screen investments and assess a company's impact on the world. Again, I think the new generation is going to be quite, quite, uh, quite um, uh, focused on this. And maybe this is the reason why the oil majors in, 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 in the FNP are not participating in the market rally. Give an example, 15 years ago, oil companies comprised 15% of the S&P. Today, they comprise only 3% of the market cap of the S&P. And you have major funds like the Norges Fund and people like that who are exiting the space. So, you know, I, I think it's a very important part of the investment uh, flavors to go forward. It's very important for us to understand this. Right, thank you, Praveen. Uh, let me bring on board Deepak, uh, Deepak Parikh. Deepak Parikh uh, uh, has, is involved in digitization of agriculture to enable more 
crop per drop per dollar per acre and per farmer. This is amazing. Deepak, I would like you to, he, he's also the CEO and co-founder of DigiAgri, digiagri.com. Uh, uh, Deepak, over to you. Just let's have your two minutes, please. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for this opportunity to talk on behalf of uh, a billion strong group called Farmers. Small and marginal farmers are what is at the focus of what we do. And we do it using digital tools. The idea is very simple that uh, we need to ensure that the farmers of the world, they keep on becoming sustainable so that they keep on serving quality food on our tables. Now, COVID has opened up the underbelly of this world. Now, there are two critical things when you are in the current situation. One is food and second is internet. That is what we all are seeing. And that is the two areas we work in. The biggest challenge so far has been that we have created agriculture in a manner for past 50 years that we always keep the burden of food security on the farmers. Now, without right sort of investment, without right sort of business models, we have pushed them to the limit where actually they themselves cannot feed themselves. So now critical work we need to do as a society is that we need to invest in a manner in a socially sustainable way so that the farmers get their dues. We cannot keep on saying we subsidize farmer. Unfortunately, you will be surprised that farmers subsidize us because we cap their price at which they sell. We don't cap the input at what the price what they buy. So we have created a totally unsustainable system and COVID has made that very, very transparent to us that we cannot continue with those type of value chain and invest in, investment on a scale of impact has to happen in agriculture and it has to happen now. And that is what we will be intervening in this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, let's move on to our uh, fourth panelist here, Ravi Sevak. Uh, Ravi, uh, over to you after I tell what you do. You are uh, into environment, sustainability, and drinking water space for over two decades. And uh, you have led Safe Work Networks activities in India since they commenced in 2009. Uh, you were also the sustainability director at PepsiCo India, where uh, you reduce the plant water consumption annually by more than 2.6 billion liters across 34 plants worldwide we uh, put it over to you for you to tell us what happened yeah. my greetings thank you for having us safe water network is not only an implementer which gives over a million people safe drinking water daily at rupees 5 for 20 liters we convene the entire sector together so that we can learn from each other and present our difficulties to the those in power or deciding policy. We are also organization which gathers the knowledge from all our colleagues and sector and disseminates it. Above all, in environment sustainability, my two decades of experience is any investment pays back in two to three years. In addition to that, it saves either global warming or groundwater or reduces load through solid waste reduction. The longest investment I have made uh, was eight years in wind turbines. But drinking water is certainly longer. Most of the licensees need 25 to 30 years for them to become viable. But it is the more core investment that anybody should make because that's what makes the public healthy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Raviji. Thank you very much. We have a set uh, for all the guests who are online. Uh, welcome to this uh, particular panel. And thank you very much for a suggestion from Aneri Shah that thank anybody who is not speaking kindly mute the mics because I think the noise is floating. Thank you, Aneri, for that. Uh, uh, thank you, all four of you, for bringing up your two minutes of this thing. And let me start with the questions. Uh, so, Parag, I'd like to come to you first. And um, we talked about this conscious thing. I said capitalism 2.4. I said uh, we have to become this uh, responsible society. We all know what's going on and how much the planet can take or not. And therefore, uh, instead of looking at it as something that we need to be worried about, we look at it as an opportunity. So my question to you, Parag, is uh, that responsible investment for inclusive growth and sustainable development, uh, private investment can be a very big enabler. You know, and we have to we have to start looking at it from an enabling perspective. And that's how the government or for that matter, all investors are looking at it. All people who want to run businesses, they have to consider this as a very key ingredient or the uh, uh, now you can't do something which is wrong. 
you know you can't do something which affects people in the wrong way so i want to come to you you talked of conscience uh give us what kind of right conditions could be there to create jobs to boost things or uh, what kind of conscience can we bring to the table as investors and be very clear not just the sdgs that have been defined by united nations but we as people when we are sitting there what have you what has been your experience around this yeah so uh, so thank you you know i mean the sdgs that the un has prescribed i mean for me i treat them as 17 chapters i think each one has to define and author each chapter the way the uh, they bring intend to bring their approach to the table um, you know as far as uh, implementation is concerned you know through the through the safe drinking water initiative that we've taken i mean uh, like i said we are an implementer we are a services company what do we do we use water safe water as a medium of change as a medium of bringing about economic growth so uh, safe water for us is not a product it is not a it is not something that we are out to sell it is a medium through which we create jobs we create social entrepreneurship opportunities we are doing vocational training skill development women empowerment uh, increase education for children and there are and, and so many more i mean i can keep talking about all the benefits that we, even boosting economic growth i mean allowing a lady to conduct herself in a manner that she can contribute to the economic status of her family itself is extremely compelling a reason and because she doesn't have to go out and spend 6 hours to fetch water every day therefore when we deliver water to our household to the doorstep of our house we are actually enabling that so all of this therefore every company has to see every corporate has to see how they can actually look much beyond the obvious it's it's more about keeping an eye on the woods and then uh, looking at the trees rather than looking at the trees and missing the woods i completely get your point because the moment we talk of social we look at it as a, a, a non profitable activity we look at it as either as philanthropy or something of uh, which is social work which doesn't make money so my question next question comes to you praveen uh, the an interesting finding is that all these kind of impact investment do not necessarily mean uh, lower financial returns and you mentioned that you know you've been able to find many opportunities and uh, they don't always have to be low returns and mckinsey published that between 2010 and 15 the average internal rate of return of impact investment this year of course you must have known these studies uh, exits has been 10% higher than the expected market rate of 7% during the period in fact the top third of deals generated an average of 34% irr so praveen you just mentioned about the fact that it doesn't have to be low profit you have to figure a way like parag said that it should become a medium of change so that people utilize it uh, for the right reasons and not just as consumers uh, so uh, it's over to you praveen what do you say about that uh, abba i think you're exactly right um, you know i think the whole space developed from the point of view of some kind of a guilt conscious from the c suite yeah where, you know we need to do something which is good for the environment to justify why we're taking such enormous compensation uh, again i cite the oil industry as a classic case of that if you look at the compensation structure The key point is that this whole whole movement now has become demand driven. Uh, the fact that the consumer, the the young the young generation, you know, people like that, you know, they demand now that they want to basically have uh, economic growth, but not at the cost of of, of of their futures and of their planet. And this young lady, Greta Thunberg, for example, makes a very very powerful point about that. Um, we actually feel, and we invest globally, not just in in India. We we find. very big opportunities in many key areas uh, sort of as as uh, para pointed out uh, uh, agriculture for example is a big one uh, you know uh, so we have invested in a, in a project in africa where we the irrr is over 50% uh, you know we make very clear that the certain we we invest in these projects because we get a very good return but at the same point we are very keen on working with the community providing education clean water building roads hospitals all like that kind of stuff and that is very key to the dna of the project now the beauty of this whole whole sort of system is that when you then need to go and talk to additional investors to come in you find that there's a lot of esg targeted funds whether they're sovereigns whether they're impact investment funds and so forth Uh, who are interested in that and they also very keen to see that this is not just lip service you know to sort of a little bit of money stuff to I- I attract them but that you're serious about this and if they see that you're serious about this they come in and invest with you now the good thing is when you when you have 
uh, a sovereign coming and mess with you, then you want to go and raise some debt against the project. Well, you suddenly find that you're raising debt at two percentage points cheaper than otherwise. So the whole ecosystem now works very neatly uh, and, and it's sort of coming together. Uh, so I think that, you know, gone are the days where you have to sort of say, well, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm doing something good for the planet and therefore I need to take to get to my, to, to, you know, and I, I wouldn't take, take a lower return. I think you can match the two and that is very helpful. I completely agree with that, Praveen, because I think uh, what you just mentioned, the younger, the millennial generation is so concerned now about creating impact than, than the other previous generations, not just business anymore. So the good needs to be woven in and it, it, is need, it needs to be part of that. We can't afford to ignore that anymore. Uh, so that brings me to, uh, to, to uh, Deepak. Uh, Deepak, uh, wherever this, uh, the kind of things that you're doing in agriculture, where investment does occur, the local economy does not always possess the capacity and policy tool to reap the potential benefits of a business going into that space, especially in agriculture like you're there, you know, our policy frameworks and you mentioned about subsidization for farmers and whatever, but the farmers are not getting the benefit of what is happening over there. So as an investor, when you go in there, uh, uh, what kind of uh, capa local capacities are you people utilizing? Uh, with agri your agri project and what kind of policy tools do you think we still need to bring in to bring the benefit to not just the farmers but to your project to bring that that uh, that that uh, reap the harvest and bring it to the people and benefit everybody on the way i do believe there's there's lack of policy over there so i'd like to hear from you what do you think yes yeah, sure so if you see that like you know if, let's talk about the elephant in the room that yes. when we talk about creating local capacities so farmer, unfortunately, are being for, as I said, for, for decades, have been driven by the policy. So when we say green revolution, they start using more fertilizer without knowing that after two decades, their yeah. cost of cultivation would be 400 percent. Right. Yeah. While the prices don't go up. So the challenge here is that when we talk about the local capabilities, first of all, the local capabilities has to be driven in an entrepreneurial way rather than something top the bottom where actually the public sector or the government start pushing it. The need creation of the farmer, that is what we do. So I'll just give you a very small example. We talk about big digital platforms, which we have created. During COVID, my farmer said, my biggest problem is that I'm not able to show my produce to my buyer. I cannot travel with my tractors because there is a lockdown. How can I help? How can you help? And then we, we did a little bit of our own soul searching and we said that forget the platform, just teach every farmer we have how to do a WhatsApp video call so that he can communicate with their buyer and show their produce on a WhatsApp video call. And believe me, 150 farmers we trained in Central Gujarat, they were able to sell their potatoes. So the challenge is that you'll have to find an innovative way of taking the new technologies to the farmer. Now coming to the policy part of it. See, policy is driven, unfortunately, with only to cap inflation. Again, uh, sorry for being a little bit politically incorrect for gaining votes from the farmers. These are the two basic agenda of any policy making. Whenever we talk about democracy, dictators don't need policy. So let's not get into that. Now, the biggest problem we see here is that for decades, we have been talking about doubling farmer income, increasing farmer income, increasing MSP. Believe me, they don't have any impact on the farmer. Four percent of the farmers are only able to access the MSP. Now, what is the whole game of MSP? What we need to do as a policymaker is that ensure farmer is able to be more profitable. He is not looking for your charity. Allow him to put his prices. Allow him to ensure that he is not exploited by the Mandi system, which I believe this government is trying to do. How successful they will be, only time would tell. So access to the market on their terms, ensuring that the inputs are controlled only with the mindset of it does not impact negatively the environment, not with the mindset of that it is Chinese, American or British, right? Let them buy the input, which is more relevant to them. Don't control that. Now, I would like to end this uh, my intervention by saying that we as a country, I'm because we are talking about India, we as a country need to understand agriculture is going through stress where if we don't take care of it now, Believe me, we would be food insecure, which would be also a challenge for the national security itself. Abba, you're on mute if you're speaking. Sorry, my mistake. Uh, so uh, uh, we were like what we were just watching that the government is uh, doing this Atma Nirbhar thing and uh, even saying that we should stop all imports. I think agriculture becomes a very powerful uh, one of the sectors. One of the key sectors in which people people uh, like yourself can be. And I, that, that takes me to Ravi. Ravi ji, uh, we have Parag, Dr. Parag here. We have you who are into Safe Water. Uh, and you have been leading Safe Water Network activities in India since 
2009 and we see that uh, recently we heard that we want to have uh, we have we have this ambitious plan of having safe drinking water in our taps i want to ask you that you've been part of that uh, you've been part of that entire uh, uh, you know dream and we want to drink water from our taps like we would do in singapore so what do you have to say about that we wrote hargar jal for ministry of drinking water and sanitation in 2017 18 it found its place in both the organization political uh, organizations manifesto and this uh, this party is which is in power is implementing it we are completely for it that each home must have safe drinking water at tap however it is going to take time in rural it is the budget is about 500000 crore 5 lakh crore urban it cannot be any smaller so all this investment is not going to come out of thin air it has to be made viable for people to invest in it and to sustain it and in the meantime if drinking water cannot be served on tap each one of us have a point of use filter at home which a poor person cannot afford can they be given that 20 liters of treated water daily at home so that whatever other water comes through either chapakal or tap water which is treated or untreated people are able to use it for other usage like ablution cleaning and toilet etc but for drinking at least that 20 liters drinking and cooking they are made available so it is only complementing the effort of the government of nal se jal jal jeevan mission urban or rural or har ghar jal these are the different names it is being used the janajal and safe water network and 30 other people who are doing this work are only complementing this effort or of the government so that people remain healthy like you and i are thank you uh, aba allow me to come in over here it's a lovely question you've asked and i cannot but uh, help but uh, but in or chime in here please go ahead go ahead so, you know uh, uh, for, you know as much as i agree with uh, with what ravi has just said is, you know he has been uh, uh, he's been working at the strategic level and at the tactical level on the operating level and so, as have we and our understanding is very clear and i say this without being condescending piped water to every home is a piped dream what i do, what do i mean by that it is not going to be it will never be possible for the government of india to achieve 100% coverage if the government of india for example had decided 20 years ago to give a cabled connection electricity connection to every home in india would it ever have been possible the answer is no uh it's a combination of wind energy solar energy uh, autonomous independent plants on every household rooftop and so on and so forth that and captive power generation plants that people built to be able to then now today they claim that they are 100% uh, electrified similarly in the water space a combination of nal se jal fused with har ghar jal where har ghar jal so it's not just about filters in homes or or, or water uh, coming out of the taps it's also about catering to those homes that are irregular colonies that are that do not have access to a water connection at all how do you deal with them how do you serve them they have as much right to get 20 liters of water per day as much as you and i do or, or anybody else does so it has to be a hybrid approach a multi pronged multilateral and a multi uh, 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 you know beneficiary kind of an approach agreed i i completely agree with you and i think uh, uh, you didn't uh, there is no uh, space for con- being condescending here i think we are trying to figure uh, what kind of combination of policy ground reality Absolutely. solutions can be bring together because it's a process and its process takes its own uh, it and it has its ground level difficulties uh, in implementation so uh, like earlier deepak said we are implementers uh, deepak i'm going to come back to you one more time uh, to ask you especially for the informal sector and i think this question goes to also ravi ji uh, parag all of you uh, because there is some level of informality in the water as well as agriculture sector that we need to address and the informal economy is sizable in this country especially in india it's uh, way too big uh, to be addressed just by simple policy or one particular way of doing things and the hybrid models the combination models the multi layered approaches 
and you know recalibrating your approach is is an important part of the entire process and implementation uh, so i want to ask all three of you and any of you could answer that in this informal sector the sizable sector in this country significant part of the economic activity is actually left out and the benefits uh, are not distributed in a proper way or the implementation is also not distributed in a proper way what do you have to say in terms of the regulatory frameworks of the government uh, especially the the licenses and the taxation because this is an issue which needs to be addressed uh, very openly rather than being politically correct about it we'd rather be politically incorrect at this point of time and ask ourselves what do we really need to do what how do we need to approach the government and ask them to either you know uh, loosen up the regulatory frameworks or uh, uh, you know figure out a, a tax model or a working model uh, where the government involvement is there so it goes to all the the two water experts and one agriculture expert yes so Sir, I would... okay after you after one at a time so who comes first okay so just because it is agriculture i okay. i would like to just just add couple of things so so you are right that unfortunately like you know when we talk about uh, government it it becomes like you know political and it becomes little bit of uh, incorrect politically uh, the challenge is that we try to make a poor system very efficient that was the mandi system through ena right after 5 years we are seeing that we have what we have done is that we have put give steroid to something which was abusive to the farmer we have connected all the mandi so previously the manipulation used to happen at local mandi now it is being happen at the national level so the biggest challenge which we see today is that the government need to distance itself and make control of agriculture ecosystem less dominant that's very very important so okay. unfortunately the government has been doing something on a other direction by because of the social impact of farming itself they have been yeah. trying to control the sector too much so if you want to make the system more formal first of all you have to stop regulating it too much more regulation means if i have to do lot of compliance i would say that let us be out of the system rather be inside the system because too much of compliance okay. second thing which government this is class class one point second second thing which government need to do immediately is that ensure that the how they are taxing both direct and indirect taxing on input and the output need to come in sync because it is actually totally out of sync so these are two points which i would like Thank you, Ravi ji. I come to you next with the same question. What demonetization could not do to formalize digital transaction? COVID did it in two months. Eighty <laughs> percent well plus of our transactions are now online Absolutely. by the social entrepreneurs, self-help groups, and uneducated or tenth pass entrepreneurs. And hence, my point is. that community has to see value and you have to provide just the infra people use it thank yes. you one short uh, comment here abha is yes. there is no greater tool to democratizing society than safe drinking water it is it is something that levels out and removes all unevenness and all the various so called strata of society that have been built by society and you know called labeling people ews labeling people middle class lower middle upper middle affluent super affluent uh, is is all uh, end of the day safe drinking water is the leveler and it is the greatest democratizing tool so if the government understands that and they they don't take it for granted i think it's very important to classify water and safe water from each other they are distinctly different untreated water today has been found to carry traces of covid-19 and therefore the un has already issued a statement saying it is it is hazardous to consume untreated water therefore water before consumption whether for cooking or for drinking must be treated and that has has to be adopted by the government as the biggest deterrent to being able to control the pandemic going forward very true sure. Uh, uh i think yeah we we got the point i think we if we can get the government's attention on these uh, couple of things which are very uh, basically we have learned from covid covid has taught us some very big lessons which we were trying to like you said uh injecting steroids into dead spaces and trying to make them uh, come alive uh, covid actually brought us all it it is another biggest leveler for us so uh i that brings me to praveen praveen uh this kind of impact investing has of late captured the attention of the world and the global uh, steering group that is gsg has estimated that the global market for impact investment will be 
uh, billion by 2020. Uh, so one of the key challenges that I've, I've been listening to all of you and I've been reading about this and all of you are in that field. Uh, the, the, the sustainability of operations in countries like India, you're already investing in India. Uh, you, you are also part of an investment bank here. How much of that sustainability, because the numbers are very big, are we in a position to recover those numbers based on the way we are able to sustain our businesses over here? Because sustainability of businesses over here is a huge, uh, huge issue with people. Yeah, I think the way to look at it is whether it's in India or, or out of India, eventually it'll be demand driven. So if you're making a product which basically has creates a good, you know, uh, think about sort of what's happening to the environment right now with COVID, since we're on the topic of COVID. Uh, you know, the citizens of Jalandhar can see the Himalayas for the first time in 40 or 50 years. You know, do they want to go back to the to, to, a, to a situation where once COVID's gone, they don't see the Himalayas again? Then that's probably going to happen. But it probably will also create a counter reaction saying that, look, we would rather invest in two like companies and one is doing something which is environmentally good and the other is not. You know, that's where I would, I would like to buy that product. I would like to invest in that product. The interesting thing is funds are available. Uh, on an international level, funds are available and significant amount of funds are available for the right type of investment. And this is one of the things which we've actually seen in, in, in projects which we've invested in. Not necessarily projects in India, but globally. When we actually can, can see that the project has a very, very good environmental impact, you will be amazed how many large pools of money are, are available to invest in. That's a very, very key issue. I had not anticipated this mute unmute part, so I forget every time. Uh, 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 the whole idea here is now this is to all the panelists. We have understood through COVID uh, that community and for us, when you mentioned about democratizing water and be, it being a leveler, I think there are so many places where this leveling needs to be done. Uh, so there is one thing which is common uh, and it can be democratized because we consume water but there's so many other areas in and we consume food uh, but uh, if we were to really really talk about democratizing anything at all uh, com communities are thriving and surviving on various things uh, so my question to all of you and i go one by one to each uh, praveen i come to you first a uh, community and uh, being able to sort of bring about responsible practices uh, gov we, we have rules, but rules are never followed very well. And uh, eventually we learn after many, many decades that something wrong has happened. Uh, today, the situation is that we can't commit these wrongs. And Praveen, I'm going to ask you this question. Uh, amongst your projects that you've been doing, uh, how far community has played a role? Because community now needs to be brought in the forefront. We cannot do without building communities. We cannot do without addressing communities. We cannot uh, do anything uh, without uh, calling community the key uh, sort of uh, receiver of whatever benefit we try to create. Absolutely. Let me describe it, uh, very briefly in a, uh, an example which we're using actually in Africa, where it's an agricultural project, so it's very apropos. Uh, we start by bringing in, you go to the local level, talk to them in the United States Africa, so you talk to the chief of the village. You bring these people on site. And what we've done there, we haven't displaced any farmers, we've taken a long piece of government land. We've, we've brought in the capital equipment, we've brought in the harvesters, the tractors, and the stuff which they hadn't seen yet. We then sit down every week with the local community and say, this is our plan, this is what we want to do, since, you know, and please come and work with us. So we're employing 1,000, 1,100 panels. On the back end of that, we're providing very importantly, as a brought up by the panel, clean drinking water. There's nothing better for a, for, for a mother to find that her children are drinking clean water. She could, is, the, is, is you know, the, the primal point of the family. If she's happy, you know, the whole family is happy, things work better. Um, we provide education for the kids. And all this is done at our cost. We're not asking anybody for it. So when you integrate these sort of things, you actually bring the, the, the community into the system. You know, you're working with the community, you're enhancing the community, you're giving them good employment and higher wages, etc. cetera. It, it's a very good virtuous cycle that you need to control. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, Ravi ji, I come to you. In our case, it is community which runs it from day one. Under the lockdown, April volume was 18% higher than March, and May volume was 22% higher than April. Because it was the local community 
which was owning it, operating it, and functioning it. And they were giving water quality of the quality that my seven-month-old granddaughter born in San Francisco could go and drink directly from there. That is the pride that we have in community-operated systems, and we do believe in them. We completely invest in them. No, absolutely. I'm just chiming in here. One line here is with the reverse migration that is taking place, uh, that has taken place in the last three months. It's very important to understand that that communities, strengthening communities, is where lies the core of India now. Yes. It's, you know, whether it is water, whether it is food, whether it is resources, whether it is anything for that matter, whether it is jobs, vocation, people are not in a hurry to come back to cities to continue working there. So if those communities are strengthened, I think India will witness a phenomenal amount of bottom up strength that will, you know, per so percolation will happen uh, reverse. Uh, you know, uh, and the strength at the root, at the grassroots level will actually lend itself to the top. Deepak? Yes, so we also work with the community. So we create the local entrepreneur who actually drive the whole village. In most of the village we work in, without community-based models, such scalable projects are impossible. So if you want to impact the society and you want it to be sustainable, you'll have to work with those communities and that is given. Anything other than that, I don't think is going to fly. I completely agree with all of you. And I think uh, we are we will be running out of time in about three minutes from now. So let me just give it a quick closure. Uh, the major focus areas of impact investment in India are financial inclusion, which is what investors are looking at, uh, health, hunger, clean energy, water, education, gender equality, sanitation. And several of these fact, um, areas have seen companies flourish. And uh, I think this is this is open doors for all of us who are looking to uh, run uh, either I uh, bring about social change or something to get those levelers in, to get that democratization in, to get that DNA into the business where sound and responsible business practices will help level uh, that playing field for other businesses. So we are, when we are doing it just in a capitalistic model, this is a socio-capitalistic model, somewhat impact investing social and that hybrid uh, combination, uh, doing good for others model, the conscientious model, and I think the part of the challenge of financing for development is uh, having the government uh, come up with policy frameworks or making it convenient for people to run these kind of businesses and to let that social uh, impact go out to the people who are supposed to benefit from that. So with, uh, we have two minutes left. Uh, Deepak, I come to you one line. What do you want to say uh, to close this? Whenever next time you eat something, please thank a farmer. Maybe your wishes would work for him. Wonderful. Ravi ji. Parag. Uh, Parag India can, can, yeah, India can lead the charge in the in, in the social sector and, and, and create a benchmark for the entire world to emulate. Praveen. Industry can help create a better society for everyone. Oh, wonderful. And Ravi ji. India has entrepreneurship built into their core. Wow. And now when we are following the sustainable development goals or UN sustainable development goals, uh, Parag, you said there are 17 chapters for me. I think all life revolves around those SDGs. Absolutely. And you pick one, the other one comes in. So it's all plugged in. And I think we need to start looking at it from the big picture perspective and from the social benefit perspective, people perspective, because like I'm going to put my last two cents here. I'm a people building expert. I'm a social design expert. I believe all the things that you're doing have to benefit people and people have to grow through that process. And if people are not growing and it's just making money, I'm sure a lot of people will stop doing the things that any business or any investments are doing. When we consume, we also grow and we must, uh, it's my two cents here, we must incorporate that growth people's growth into that sector. So you can all call me to talk about it once this session is over. And I think it's a very important part of the investing activity to involve people, not just as consumers, but as partners at some point uh, to be able to access what's going on to grow through. And if they grow through it, they're going to come back to it again and again. And that's, I think, is very important. So thank you very much, Deepak. Thank you very much, Ravinji. Thank you. Uh, and Para, thank you, Praveen for being here. Uh, it was a wonderful session and we, I, I'm sure everybody enjoyed what we were doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.